Hi, everybody. I'm Tom Anschutz from at and I'm really pr privileged to be here today. No, no, really, I am. I guess um, I, I got this special treatment. I understand if you've got the paper um, version of the program. I'm the only speaker with an embossed name, so I'm really, really happy about that. Um, so today I have a talk in sort of three parts. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about AT&T's business imperatives. I won't spend a lot of time, but I think it does make some sense to go into the details around what drove us to do this. Um, and then, of course, to be on point, I'm going to talk a little bit about open source, what it means to us, and you know, how, you, how you start getting your mind around it. And then I'm shamelessly going to spend a little time talking about reconstructing broadband access, because that's not just my favorite color, it's my quest. Right? So why don't we start off, AT&T's business imperatives. About two years ago, or two and a half years ago, a number of the architects within AT&T got together and started planning for you know, what will our business look like in 2020. I mean, you hear us talk about 2020 a lot, right? And we talked about or discovered you know, how many devices would attach to our network, how much traffic would we carry, and so forth. And, um, what was interesting is that it wasn't that hard to figure out, and it was really very different from the kind of business we were in today and the kind of situation that we were in, well, two years ago. And so what we believed from this, these characteristics of 2020 is that we had very, a set of business imperatives. They're in the gray boxes, and, um, and that, that led then to a technology and architecture direction for the company. So first and foremost, we realized that we needed to open our network, that it needed to become modular, it needed to be sort of very flexible, nimble for change, that this would be accomplished via software and programmability. Uh, we realized that it needed to simplify the network and scale it, right? If you think about today, AT&T might have some 300 million mobile devices attached to our network. In 2020, if uh, you think about machine to machine and Internet of Things, we think it may be well north of 10 billion things connected to the mobile network. And the kinds of infrastructure you build to handle these kinds of situations is quite different. And so that becomes a, a major driver for our architecture. Um, we also, you heard this morning John Donovan talk about video uh, driving how we think about networking in the future. Um, it might be smart not to think about shuffling packets, but rather think about understanding videos and dealing with them, dealing with content at a sort of higher content-centric way. And then uh, the third part is to increase value for the network. So it needed to become elastic um, and, and agile and dynamic, um, and it also needed to be open for third parties to be able to help in that sort of space. Uh, we realized that you need, we need to become kind of the Walmart of networking, right? It needs to be extremely uh, cost uh, effective and performant. And we see that there's a lot of new opportunities with the infrastructure that we're about to talk about um, to, to get beyond just being the, quote, pipes company that you've heard telcos you know, lament about for decades. And so with this kind of infrastructure that we're, um, that we're, that's part of Domain 2, we think that there's a lot of opportunity to do things beyond simply moving packets and to hosting applications and content and so forth. The blue box at the bottom of the slide is what we're going to do about these imperatives. So we have two um, cornerstone technologies. There's network functional virtualization, which sort of pulls together hardware from software, and there's software-defined networking, which allows you to control um, separate control from forwarding. Um, now, these are interesting enough uh, as solos acts, but when you put them together, they are much more than the individual items. And we believe very strongly, and in fact have energized the company around um, developing this kind of combined architecture, which you might call a network cloud infrastructure that we're going to distribute through our central offices all around, you know, all around the world and that will provide our networking functions and services as a workload on top of that infrastructure. So that's sort of, um, that's sort of what we're up, up to. Uh, now I'll switch gears and talk about open source. So this is an interesting thing because it's one of those, uh, it's one of those things where you, you wind up growing as a person and as a company, I think, uh, when you start thinking about open sources and as you go through it. Um, 
So if you, if you go to sort of the almost religious version here, uh, there is sort of an enlightenment or an aha moment where you know, open source might start off as a thought, well, here's some, here's some software that comes nearly for free and I can just download it and make use of it. Um, but there is sort of this continuum that goes on and on and you eventually get to the point where um, what you realize is that it's, it's really not about free software. It's really not about, um, about the, the code itself as it is the, the constructs, the tools, the community that put that all together. And of course, um, there is the license agreements, right? <laughs> So I know that, uh, for example, for AT&T to, um, to get to the point where we would accept Ubuntu, uh, we had to go through, I forget how many packages, you gotta read every license and make sure that, that, they, um, that they have, uh, you know, th that they work for your business at the end of the day. And I think others are gonna probably comment a bit more on that topic, so I won't belabor it. Um, so one of the things I like to do, and um, I, I like when Dave Meyer speaks because he always has these interesting examples and insights, and so I'm gonna shamelessly pick on you if you're out there. Um, so this is something that uh, struck me as, wow, this is what it really is about. And I heard this at the OpenStack um, conference in Atlanta. Uh, Dave was talking about his experiences at, after the first year with Open Daylight, and um, and, and this rang true. This rang is, really was sort of my great takeaway from that conference, that the things that we're building, this particular piece of code or this particular open hardware design are really not a sustainable advantage for our companies, that it's really the sort of the blue dots at the bottom of this slide, that having a kind of engineering system a collaboration, tool chains, and things that help you generate uh, these artifacts, having a culture of collaboration and agile development, and having the right people and processes, this is really the secret sauce of open source. It's less about having free software, and it's more about, how, like Dave said, um, it's not what you build that's important, it's how you go about building it. So for me, that's the underlying, uh, that's the underlying secret around um, open source SDN for carriers. And for AT&T, um, this, uh, this has turned out in a sort of following way, that um, we're looking for community, we're collaborating as a company uh, with academics, you've seen us here with Onos, we're active with ODL, OPNFV, and all the other items you see listed there. Um, and you wonder if open, you know, open winds up showing up in all of these various consortia and forums and so forth. It seems to be the new dot com, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and then there's engineering systems, and I'm happy to say, you know, within AT and T, we started developing um, around Yang tools for modeling services instead of building them sort of from the ground up. And we've contributed back some of those tools inside our company. We have tools like uh, like our version of GitHub. There's a thing called T-Space, which includes wikis and blogs and, and things that allow you to communicate you know, very uh, quickly and in sort of the modern era. And there's, there's our own version of uh, WebEx, which we call AT&T Connect. And if you're an AT&T vendor, you probably are lamenting AT&T Connect out there. Um, so, and then there's culture, right? And you've heard both Andre and then um, John talk about how we're now becoming a software company. And, I, I'm an example of that. I've taken various various training around Python and, and um, Erlang and other kinds of things that really warped my brain after this many years of not coding. Uh, but it's great, and it gives you a great perspective on how a software company thinks and how architectures can be rethought from a cloud perspective or from a software architect's perspective. And finally, um, once again, I'll go, I'll go and lean on what uh, both Andre and John have said earlier in that our company is really all about people and process and changing the skills that we have in the company, um, getting people to create or, or come up with nano degrees and, and enhance their skills to be really, um, you know, remain relevant in the, um, in the, in the ecosystem going forward. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna say about um, open source. And now I'm gonna spend the last few minutes talking about applying these principles to uh, GPON and G.Fast. Um, and so 
<laughs> John Donovan already, uh, already expanded GPON, right? The Gigabit Passive Optical Network, Optical Line Terminator. I I'm so proud of him. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have here, uh, right? <laughs> so I, we have here a picture that um, could have come right out of a standards document. It's a typical sort of canonical a set of boxes that are vertically integrated. And this is how uh, broadband optical networks are provided today. Um, and in fact, if you're an MSO, it's not too different. You just cross off GPON OLT and put CMTS, and then you've got a, uh, a node that doesn't say PON splitter, and you're pretty close to this architecture. Um, so we're going to look at this completely differently. And this is how telcos would have looked at a problem in the past. Uh, if you think about it from a cloud perspective, however, you might look at it quite differently. And to begin with, you might think about, well, I don't want to think about boxes. I want to think about functions and types of functions. And so I've got a bunch of access media. They might be GPON, they might be G.Fast, they might be Doxis, and then, or, or, or you know, 5G radio. And then I have a number of per subscriber functions. I've got things that I need to scale out according to the number of customers that I attach to the, to the network or to the infrastructure. And then I also have a set of functions that are sort of more multi-tenant. They are provided to everyone. But I want these things to be on one common NFE infrastructure. And then I want to be able to connect that to the rest of the world with an, uh, a gray IO box here that goes between offices. So if you think that's too high level, um, we do zoom in, and if you watch the colors carefully, um, here we go. This is the next level of detail. So I've got the uh, access on the left in the same color where we're um, providing uh, GPON in, the, in, the, in a virtual OLT. We're working with GFAST and DPUs, and in the home, we're virtualizing residential gateways. And, by virtualizing, I don't mean that we're suddenly getting rid of the hardware in the home. It's really more about being able to create new services that you could have never put in that kind of a box to begin with. We attach all of this to a fabric, like top of rack switches, and that's the red sections in this picture. Um, they allow us to create an L2 topology, so customers have isolation, and then connect them to a set of scale-out containers, like Linux containers, where we have what I've labeled here a virtual service gateway. And so the thought process here, it's not a BNG, it's not a CPE. A virtual service gateway is doing all the per subscriber policies, whether they're on behalf of the subscriber or on behalf of the service provider. They used to happen in different network elements, but let's face it, they really didn't need to be that way. That's sort of an artifact. This is part of the disaggregation. What do you learn from that? Well, you learn that maybe you've got more complexity and more network elements, and if you tore, tore down the walls from those elements and brought together those, uh, those like functions, you wind up being able to simplify the architecture. And that's what these VSGs um, imply. Because they are cloud-based, you can spin them up uh, on demand. And if you go see our demo, we attach a customer to the network and spin up the resources to, to serve them in about 15 seconds. It's pretty good. Um, and if you have that kind of infrastructure, being able to spin up a container that does, let's say, um, a special level of customer care, if you've got a problem that you need to solve, these become things you can do now in the new model that were not tractable and, and definitely not cost effective in the way we, things were done before. So moving along to the orange part of the chart. What we see is uh, an application of SDN once again. And this is where oh, we take sort of the control plane and um, instead of having it in the vertically integrated box, we take all of those features and functions you would have found in an access node and we write them on top of SDN control. And similarly so for the side that faces between offices where you want typically a BGP kind of control plane, um, the SDN controller provides that once again. This is also the place where you'd attach various kinds of multi-tenant services or functions and features that would apply to multiple customers, things like VoIP and IPTV and content distribution. Okay, this though is still probably something that more, is more like what a architect from a telco would look, would look uh, like drawing his pictures. And I can tell you that's exactly what happened. If you had someone who thought more like a cloud uh, provider, you would show this differently. You would say that what I have are services, 
that these uh, functions um, embody, and that I have a suite of these things. And what I want to do is create them at a small enough, you know, like a microservice architecture, so that I can combine them and, and compose them to create different kinds of high-level features and capabilities that customers are interested in buying. And so here's, you know, we've kind of played a little around with the names of the functions and the charts here, but it gives you a good idea that you might have a suite of microservices that you compose to provide mobile access or business access or consumer broadband access on wireline, um, all from the same infrastructure, simply by adjusting the compositions. All right, and then, sort of to, to hammer once again on one of the topics that both um, Andre and John mentioned. I've been in the business for a little while, and I can tell you I've spent a lot more time on the left side of this chart than I would care to admit. Um, it was the case that if you had a new concept, a new big idea, chances were really small that the equipment you had in your network could support that idea from the get-go. So your first thing you did is you need to sell it in your company, right? And then you need to sell it to some few other companies or suppliers to work with you to drive a standard for this new kind of feature or function. And then you, we all know how standards work. You take a couple of years and you send people to Geneva or some other place like that. And then with any luck, um, what comes out in five or six years is sort of 20 or 30 percent what you had in mind to begin with. The market's moved on and some of the standard works and some of it doesn't. And you can read the bullets for yourself. If you're not careful, you wind up being completely locked into a regime and, and worried about how you're going to make your business work. And what I would tell you is I've had my first experience on the right-hand side of this, of, of this picture, and it was like nirvana, to go back to the, uh, back to the Bodhi part. Um, in this case, we picked a number of partners. We partnered with Owen Lab and with some of the silicon manufacturers for the architecture on Cord. And, um, and we started with a concept at the beginning of this year. Here we are, halfway through the year, Okay, it's not something I'm going to put in the network and serve you know, your broadband with, but it's, it's doing its job. It's come way far along, and it's, um, it's more than just an idea. It's something that you can build upon and continue, to, um, and continue to make progress on. So I'm very sold on this open source and community approach toward development. I think that you know, in the bigger picture, so is AT&T. We're interested in collaborating with other carriers and other, part, and other um, collaborators in this area and realizing that we were just before lunch. <coughs> um, what I wanted to say is that we had exactly that, um, that a lot of folks got together on this cord uh, demo uh, that's out there in the Expo Center. I'd encourage you to go and have a look. Um, we're gonna have a number of other talks uh, in the afternoon that go into some of the details from this system. And, you know, it's like a comfort food at the end of the day. And I realized it was before lunch and I thought I'd show you some pictures of food just to taunt you a bit. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's been a great, it's been a great uh, learning experience and it's something I'm very eager in continuing and, and perhaps, you know, partnering with some of you out there moving forward. So thank you very much. Super, Tom. Awesome.